Uh, thank you, Tricia, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to quickly run through the presentation I prepared because, frankly, um, I'm going to probably end up repeating quite a lot that you've heard before. So I'll go through that quickly. And then I thought I'd spend the balance of my time looking at um, a statement that's in your pack that we've received from the European Commission. Uh, we invited them to come along and uh, present at the... Uh, uh, at today's event, but they were unable to do that, but they've given us that uh, statement, and I thought it would be worthwhile if we looked at that together. So to quickly first move through uh, my uh, uh, sort of original uh, uh, pre preparation, uh, the, U the Commission is, is keen to tell us that 90, over 90% of the oil in, the U in Europe is, is produced in offshore areas. Um, it's also worth noting that 90% of that um, oil, uh, really well over 90%, comes from just three countries, UK, uh, Norway, uh, and Denmark. And let us not forget that Norway is not wholly within the EU. Um, the overwhelming majority of the offshore and gas production, if we include gas, comes from four North Sea European countries, Norway, uh, Holland, uh, UK, and Denmark. And, and all of those uh, countries have robust and fit-for-purpose regulatory regimes which are acknowledged by the Commission as being amongst the best in the world. Those are those words, their words, not, not mine. In fact, 16 EU member states have no prospect of any offshore uh, production uh, at all. Uh, and the existing regulatory regimes in the states, which, if I put, might put it that way, matter, are controlled by really professional and competent regulators who are expert in the characteristics uh, of their respective basins. Uh, looking to the offshore... Um, safety regulation it itself. It has its, its origins in the EU's commission to the Macondo incident, uh, which, as I recall, wasn't necessarily um, that sort of um, even-tempered, if I could put it that way. I thought it was some parts of it quite irrational, frankly. Uh, I remember the commissioner immediately calling for a drilling moratorium, and that was a request that he repeated on, on more than one occasion. Uh, so um, uh, I thought we always thought that, that something was going to come along, uh, and, and we've, got, uh, we've got what we've got. Um, uh, what this regulation does, as you've heard, is seek to create a one-size-fits-all uh, safety regime for all oil and gas operations across Europe, and indeed even beyond. The regulation has got extraterritorial uh, intentions too. It seeks to require European countries to take the regulation and export it into their operations abroad uh, as well. Why a regulation rather than directive? Well, you've heard this before, really, but the European Commission sees the matter as urgent. It wishes to impact upon the industry urgently. Uh, and uh, it wants to do that uh, because it sees the industry as uniform in nature, and again, is something I think I would contest. And frankly, I don't think, well, I, I don't think I've heard uh, Commission officials say uh, that they are not content that uh, this can be left to EU member states because uh, they won't implement it. If it's, if it's left up to them, they can't in a way be, be trusted to do that. And as you've heard, the regulation is opposed by representatives from uh, national regulators, trade unions and industry and stakeholder uh, right across the piece. And this stakeholder event on the 31st of March was really a, a sorry, 31st of January this year, I thought was really a sort of uh, a signal event and I, I, I had hoped that the Commission uh, would take note of what happened there. Uh, every regulator who spoke, every industry representative who spoke and every u trade union representative who spoke, led very ably by John here, spoke out against the regulation and asked the Commission to think again and that everybody was again on the same line. Please do, if you must regulate, do this by means of directive. There was one voice in the room that spoke out strongly for the regulation, indeed spoke out for a regulation which should be drafted in more aggressive terms than the current proposal, and that was the supposed NGOs. But these NGOs weren't just any NGOs, they were exclusively the environmental NGOs um, uh, Bologna, as you've heard, and Greenpeace, uh, speaking out very strongly. Um, it's a very strange definition for me of stakeholder. Uh, I'm not saying that Greenpeace don't have a, a very uh, valid role to play in society, and, and indeed it is right uh, that they do what they do. But to typify them as a stakeholder in our industry, I thought, uh, frankly, was a bit rich. Uh, why does uh, Oil & Gas UK uh, oppose... Um, this regulation will very quickly, and, and this first and foremost is it. We see this as a backward step for safety, and we are not prepared to countenance going backwards on safety. There is only one way on safety, and it has to be forwards. This will definitely take us backward for all of the reasons that you've 
uh, you, you've heard the previous speakers talking about today. Um, it, it'll gum up the system. It'll, it'll divert uh, regulatory uh, attention and the like. Uh, and the environmental objectives of it actually, frankly, are very, very unclear. We don't know what the Commission is talking about when it starts talking about environmental liability. We don't know what the sort of damages that, they, uh, that, that, that might come from this or whether some form of penal system uh, is envisaged in this. Very, very, very unclear. And as you've heard, the impact assessment is just fundamentally flawed. Uh, the idea that this regulation is going to rise, give rise to a 50% improvement in outcomes when 90, over 90% 90 of the territory covered is covered by regimes which in the, the European Commission's own admission are gold standard leading uh, uh, countries in regulation beggars belief. And furthermore... Uh, the, the impact assessment works on the basis that every outcome uh, which has uh, lasts for more than any, any spillage that lasts for more than 15 days has macondo like um, uh, repercussions in terms of cost. Again, wholly, uh, wholly unreasonable. Um, it does entail a, an unsafe diversion of regulatory resources, as we've heard, and legal competence would shift to the EU. Um, and this isn't, um, this isn't a small thing. Uh, the furtherance of safety regulation in the EU would move to, frankly, the European Commission in the light of these proposals. It wouldn't rest any more with national governments nor the UK Parliament. Uh, as we've heard, uh, we think that the, the um, uh, various people have said it, the proposal lacks proportionality. In, in our view, it also lacks sense, and I take up very much what Alfred was saying about the competence of the European Commission. L let's look at the European Commission. It's a very, this, this unit, by the way, in the European Commission is a very small one. Does it have the competence to actually oversee and, and govern all this? Frankly, I think not. And uh, because it takes us backwards in safety, because it's going to give rise uh, to great um, uh, turbulence in our regulatory r arrangements, I think uh, we think it poses a threat to UK energy security jobs and the economy. And frankly, it, it does seem to be maybe part, maybe part of, a, of, another, uh, of another agenda, a broader agenda. And it was interesting that whilst we were meeting at that stakeholder engagement on the 31st of of January this year, Com uh, Commissioner Ertinger was uh, meeting with another group, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee Conference, and he told them then, at the end of the day, what I am looking for is full competence, including of the energy mix and the decisions about how energy is processed. At the moment, it's a matter for member states, but it should, I believe, fall into the hands of the Parliament and the Council. And I, I think we can't ignore statements like that uh, when we consider what is going on uh, going on here. Uh, and what is the alternative? Well, in our view, what is required is a bit, really, frankly, a bit more of the same for the UK, uh, Norway, the Netherlands, and, uh, and the like. Strong, professional, and well-resourced, independent national regulators. And I think uh, that is a hugely important thing. Uh, 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 we hear, for example, we hear on the, on the grapevine that the uh, industry in the UK is going to be paying more for its regulatory oversight, that we're going to have more fees and the like coming in. Frankly, I think that's fine, as long as those, those payments are uh, dedicated to making sure uh, that we maintain the high standards that we have in regulatory uh, uh, and our regulators in this country. Uh, they need to be paid the right wage. Uh, we need to stop possibly poaching them, and to help in that, the government needs to pay them a, a living wage. Isn't that true, Steve? Uh, but uh, th there we are. Uh, we definitely need them. We would certainly need a, a, a culture of continuous learning and improvement. I think that is well embedded in the, in, in the UK. Uh, we need robust inspection and verification, well by well review and quality insurance and, and competence assurance, uh, competency assurance uh, as well. And, and if the EU must have legislation, and I think, I think that's an interesting question really, if we must have legislation, as other speakers have pointed out, um, we already have uh, the Extractive Industries uh, uh, Directive. And we also have uh, the uh, Environmental Liabilities Directive. Why aren't we working uh, to improve, improve those directives? Why must we have uh, more, more, uh, more legislation? However, if we really must have uh, some more legislation, then in our view, let it be a directive which targets the action uh, where it uh, is properly uh, required. But frankly, at the end of the day, and I entirely share what Gershon said a moment ago, 
purposeful collaboration across uh, and between governments and industry is really the most uh, effective approach. So in, in, in short, that's, that's the oil and gas UK view. Let me, um, if I might, just, if I've got time, to just quickly we'll, um, look at this statement. Um, so, last November, this is the, the statement from the Commission. Last November, the Commission tabled a legislative proposal on offshore safety. The proposal responded to a wide public call for improvements in safety offshore and uh, uh, in offshore oil and gas operations after the Macondo disaster and for the highest levels of safety and accident prevention in the EU. Strong public demand for such action was evidenced in council discussions as well as in the public reaction following the Commission's communication on the subject in October 2010. It's also clearly been expressed in a self-initiated decla declaration of the European Parliament. That is all very true. Um, and by the way, this, what I'm going to talk about now is not the official response to this. I, I saw this, um, this statement only just shortly before you, uh, I'm afraid. I saw it late last night. Uh, Oil and Gas UK, I can assure you, will be responding to this. Um, <clears throat> and maybe more, in more measured tones than I'm going to talk to you about it now, I suspect. Um, however, uh, whilst that's, that, that, that's true, um, there's an implication here that somehow the rest of us were all sitting by whilst uh, the, the, the European Commission considered what it was going to do in regulation. Nothing could be further from the truth. The industry in this country and in Norway and in the Netherlands, as you've, as you've heard, immediately got on to, on, onto the ball. We, we formed uh, in, in the UK, I can speak for the UK, we formed... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, OSPRAG uh, Forum, the Oil Spill Prevention and Response Adv Advisory Group, and that has been hugely um, uh, uh, active in, in its work. Uh, we certainly were not, we were not complacent, uh, and we got about, gone on about doing things, frankly, than just talking about um, possible uh, further regulation. Uh, the statement goes on, the proposal is principally focused on ensuring that oil and gas operations in European waters are subject to high common core standards in industry and regulatory practice. The Commission has deliberately opted for building on recognised practices which have already been successfully implemented in one or more European uh, jurisdictions uh, or, or which are, are supported by broad expert consensus. And again, one comes back to, uh, I thought, Alfred's excellent point. So, frankly, where is this going to take us? What is this going to do for us? What is this going to add? The, the, the answer is uh, not very much. And I think one also has to reflect upon uh, the flawed impact assessment when considering those words as well. The statement goes on, the Commission proposal only establishes the basic ground. It still requires the member states to develop their own strategies and policies to ensure safety in their waters, while the ultimate responsibility for safety continues to remain invariably uh, with, the, with the industry. And in this context, the claim that the proposals do not sufficiently address the concerns of workers' representation as expressed by the UK offshore trade unions is unjustified. Well, I'd be a brave man to speak for John Taylor on that, and I'm sure he's going to address that point later on. But I can say that we are at one with the unions in this. We don't believe that this adequately uh, addresses uh, the, the question of uh, worker, workforce uh, involvement. Uh, the Commission the go the statement goes on. The Commission proposal only establishes the basic common. Sorry, no, the, the proposal draws heavily on standards and practices applied in the North Sea. It also proposes some new measures for all jurisdictions. For instance, the risk control assessment for offshore installations, i.e., the safety case in the UK, uh, but would for the first time integrate threats to the environment arising from a major incident. Well, as I've said, uh, we have serious concerns uh, about how that is being handled in this, in this regulation. It is very unclear how that, will, uh, how that will, will take place. Another innovation is that relevant data will be collected in a common format to make them comparable across the EU. These new elements are justified and necessary for the coherence and quality of regulatory regimes across the European offshore sectors. I think we would agree that there is a good case for having standard um, uh, information and data across the, UK, uh, across the EU, uh, and, and that is one of the uh, uh, recommendations in, 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 the, in the regulation that we could go along with. Um, reactions from member states, experts, including uh, during the formal scrutiny in the Council in the past six months, strongly suggest that the core elements of the proposal are valid. The, the European Pro Parliament has now started its deliberations in the committees. Well, I think we just have to uh, agree to differ upon that point as to whether the uh, core elements of the proposal are valid. Opinions of the industry, organised labour and civil society are also forthcoming. Amongst those, Oil and Gas UK and OLF 
have voiced opposition to the Commission's proposal without offering a clear alternative for levelling up practices in the EU off sector towards common best available standards. I have to take exception to that. We have told the Commission repeatedly how we believe that this matter should be addressed. It just so happens that we take a different view with them on regulation. But we believe that this can be done. It can be done if we wish through a directive, but importantly, through cooperative, collaborative mechanisms will be much more, much more effective in spreading good practice than another piece of legislation. The Commission services remain open to constructive exchange of views, a number of meetings having taken place, including on the objections of substance. Further discussions with the broad stakeholder community are necessary, is necessary for making continued effective progress with the legislative proposal. Well, we're, we're all up for continued dialogue, I can assure you of that, but I'm afraid I also have to echo uh, what Alfred said earlier on. I'm afraid to date the conversations have been slightly sort of one-sided, really. It's very difficult for us to uh, believe that what we've been saying has really uh, been listened to. Now, it is crucial that discussions in different fora, such as the Oil and Gas UK event of the 11th of June, keep in mind the practicalities of the EU legislative process and that they focus on the true content of the Commission proposal. I think that's a warning. In this regard, a few clarifying statements are warranted. First, while the adoption of EU legislation can lead to changes in existing national legal frameworks, the proposal at stake does not aim at disrupting or invalidating what already works well in member states. Well, that may be what its aim is. What it actually does in, in, in practice um, uh, is, in our view, completely something else. Uh, we believe it's going to have exactly that, uh, that effect. In the particular UK context, the, uh, the contrast to what has been feared, widespread compliance confusion and cost uplift should not arise from the proposal because its contents are already closely aligned to the UK regime. There's another point here as well. I mean, I think we have to be careful not to be little Englanders in, in all of this. Um, all of this being aligned to the UK regime means that it's possibly not so well aligned to other fine regimes, such as the Norwegian uh, and, and the Dutch and others. Uh, and I think w we need to take that into account too. The EU legislative process involves further refining of the legal text. Within that process, the the UK government has provided a case study to support its contention that an EU regulation rather than an EU directive will have negative impacts upon the UK regime. Discussions have been held between the Commission and the UK and the Commission intends to continue dialogue in that regard. This could be, I suppose, a chink of, uh, of hope and light here. Uh, uh, maybe this case study is causing the, the Commission to, to reflect. Let us hope so. I have one other observation. I, I, it would be good if this proposal could be shared with the industry. Um, at the moment, it's only held between uh, the, the, uh, the, the government and, and the European Commission. And it would be good if we could see that too. Um, uh, we might have some helpful comments to make. Second, and still within the UK context, nothing in the proposal requires existing safety cases to be repealed or resubmitted, while determining compliance with law is a matter for the courts. Uh, the intent of the proposal is to ensure existing safety cases are amended only in respect of any new requirements, such as assessment and control of environmental standards. The, the, the words there that really trouble me is, well, whilst this is really finally to be t determined by the courts, is that, is that really what, what we're saying here? Um, I, 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 hope, I hope not. It is our view that the new proposals are going to give rise to major disruption around safety cases. Third, the proposal does not foresee transference of powers from member states to the EU. The proposal does not set up any new decision-making EU authorities, nor involve any existing EU authorities in any way in the approval or oversight of national authorities. Instead, it defines a common minimum standards for national authorities. Those standards remain fully under the control of national governments. Moreover, reports suggesting that national regulators will be subject to oversight by other third parties, such as independent verifiers, are wrong. On the contrary, independent verification schemes are to be established by operators to provide themselves with independent assurance of the integrity of their safety systems. I think they've missed the point here in the first one. It, 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 it isn't really that um, uh, we saw this creating new decision-making uh, authorities in the EU. It was that we saw a transfer 
of competence, legislative legal competence, law-making competence moving from the UK into Europe that really troubled us. I don't think we've actually ever suggested that national regulators uh, we saw in the proposals would be subject to oversight by third parties, although I think we are concerned about some other proposals which seem to be generating around EMSA, uh, the, 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 Euro the, the European Maritime Safety Agency, uh, 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 and the powers that it should be given in, in this area. A fourth, the proposal does not contain provisions enabling the Commission to bypass the co-legislators, the Council and the European Parliament, in modifying the legislation. This would be illegal under EU treaties. The proposal does foresee the use of so-called implementing and delegated powers, as is customary in EU legislation, to facilitate evolution and amendment of specific aspects of legislation over time. Full control of the outcome, however, always remains in the hands of the Council and the European Parliament, who retain the right to scrutinise and even block Commission proposals prepared <coughs> on the basis of delegated blah, blah, blah. The point, our, our concern here is not that they were ever seeking to bypass um, the legislative um, uh, process. It is, however, um, that the delegated powers that, they've been given, that they are proposing to give to the Commission are very wide under, under, the, under the draft regulation. And this idea of blocking by the Parliament and, and the Council of Ministers uh, and think about the composition of the Parliament and the Council of Ministers and how many of those representatives in those bodies have an interest in the matters uh, uh, under consideration. That idea of blocking what's going on, in our view, is likely to be uh, much more sort of uh, uh, a theoretical th than a practical uh, outcome. It's very unlikely that much blocking would, would go on, and that's, that's our real concern. The Commission, frankly, uh, would have a very strong hand here. Um, Furthermore, the Commission has already, to carry on with the statement, the Commission has already adopted a decision to constitute a group of member states, uh, offshore regulatory authorities, who will work actively with the Commission, actively inform the Commission's preparation of such secondary acts. The participation of industry representatives is provided for in the rules of the group. Uh, we understand that the chairmanship of that group uh, will, be the, the, will be the Commission and it will be up to the Commission to invite who they seek to wish to bring along to the group. So I don't think that's a guaranteed outcome either. In conclusion, um, the, the, the statement stays, uh, in conclusion, all uh, EU regimes, even the best performing ones like the UK, have margins to improve their offshore safety regimes in the light of the lessons and data from recent accidents and incidents. This view has received broad backing from legislators to date. The Commission will pursue negotiations with the Member States and the European Parliament towards a pragmatic solution whose primary focus is on the efficacy of the proposal. I think, again, I'm afraid this misses the point entirely. Uh, there is an ass assessment here, that, uh, or uh, an inference here, that we have in some way been complacent. We have most certainly not been complacent. Uh, we formed OSPRAG, a government trade union industry uh, body, which came forward with incredibly important far-ranging proposals. You've heard what the Norwegian uh, review has also uh, proposed. We have standing now committees such as the World Life Cycle Practices uh, Forum and the Oil Spill Response Forum embedded into our system here in the UK. Uh, 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 and we are also on the verge of coming forward with some, some new financial responsibility guidelines as well, which will be of huge import to the, to the whole of the industry here in the UK. So uh, the idea that we've been sitting by and waiting uh, for things to happen is frankly to miss the point entirely. We have been extremely active and we have actually improved the situation here in the UK, but we've improved upon what was already a very strong uh, situation. I do hope uh, that we will end up with a, a, a pragmatic solution to all of this. You can be assured that Oil & Gas UK will certainly uh, be looking uh, for, for that end. Uh, I'm sorry I've overrun my time, but thanks very much indeed for your attention.